Hello and welcome everybody to another Truth Proof live stream. Excited tonight. We've got a great guest on, haven't we, Paul? Yeah, we really have. And I, already in the chat, there's people. Uh, Rick said he thinks this guest is going to be one of our best, but it, it it will cater to Rick's genre, should we speak. But I know this this guy's going to be really interesting. So, what's your week been like, Les? Oh, I've been busy doing the uh, putting together uh, some of the uh, truth proof shorts as always. We do them every week, so two or three of those go out every week. Every week, so if anybody needs to catch up on them, just always uh, check. Make sure you subscribe and talking to subscribers. Thank you immensely. We have now tipped over the 9,000 subscriber uh, barrier, and it's fantastic. We, we, can't, we can't do this show without all your support. It's great, yeah. So, yeah, from me as well, thank you. Appreciate it. And uh, let's just keep uh, chipping away at it and keep it growing. You know, I have no problem. Anyway, I'd do these shorts whether we'd got nine or 9,000, to be honest with you. So it's not, not a massive issue, that, for me, but... Loads of yeah, people yeah. in chat here, uh, Les. We've got Nigel yeah, Logan, look, yeah. Tracy uh, McKay, Sober Carper, Ralph Winter, Gordon Carrick, Kim King. I saw Mrs. Linny in, but I can't see her now. Karen Behrman, I'm sure Linny will be in. Pete will be watching. Blow Shift, Fred Flintstone, Al Durham. Oh, good to see you, Al. Uh, Jess, Jessica, my daughter's doing moderating for us. And questions in caps, please. Uh, we said Martin Abbas, haven't we? Uh, Mike. The disabled Welshman is. I'm sure I've seen two of them now. Silverware, Steph, Vlad, Stargazer, there's Mag Sue and Madeline Wick, Ginge. I know that as soon as I stop saying it, another name pops up. So at Lee, Rivington Pike, uh, Dragonborn, and uh, well, honestly, uh, apologies Brilliant. because I'm going to miss names here, but uh, we'll yep. Fred Flintstone. We're going to do some as we go along anyway. But Yeah, uh, yeah. brilliant support as always, and uh, let's hope you enjoy the show. I'll be back for questions if you know the routine. I'll be back later on, and uh, without further ado, we'll bring uh, Richard on screen, and I'll disappear. Okay, Les, thank you. And Richard Freeman. Richard, thank you for joining us on Truth Proof. Thanks for having us. No, you know, you're welcome. And, you know, I've followed your work kind of on and off for years. And Richard Freeman, everybody, if you're not familiar with Richard, cryptozoologist, as well as an author and a true boots on the ground researcher. What I love about this guy, well, he gets all over the world. And I think you've got plans to continue going all over the place, haven't you, Richard? Oh, yes. There's um, plans afoot for Japan. Indonesia, many other places that I haven't been yet, and also to return back to places I've already been to to carry on the work I was doing there. Brilliant. And we can touch on some of those places, of course, the next few hours, but can you just give us a, an outline, a breakdown on Richard Freeman and how you became involved in this crazy subject that we're all immersed in? I can answer that in three words for you. <laughs> it's, it's not no, 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 is it? It's classic Doctor Who. Really? Back in the 1970s, when I was a kid, I was growing up with um, watching John Pertwee as the Doctor. And he had been incarcerated on Earth by the Time Lords. So all the monsters he fought, fought were on Earth. So they were more frightening because they were immediate. They were on your doorstep. So you had like giant maggots coming out of slag heaps in Wales and super intelligent humanoid dinosaurs that had been um hibernating under the sea for millions of years and suddenly wake up and find that this upstart ape has taken over their planet and lovecraftian aliens that possess plastic and turned anything plastic into killers and um I, I have to emphasize this is classic doctor who not the woke gender flip box ticking garbage the bbc turns out today the real doctor who john pertwee tom baker when it was frightening compelling and it was as much about horror as it was about science fiction. And along with that, stuff like David Attenborough's series, Life on Earth and um, The World About Us, stuff like that fascinated me. I've always been fascinated uh, with animals and I've worked with animals all my life. After I left school, I became a zookeeper. Uh, do you remember the PG Tips chimps on the adverts? I worked yeah, at the zoo, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, that, the zoo that they were at, Twycross. And I did a youth training scheme where I worked with a little bit of everything. 
and then they took me on as the reptile keeper and i took over the, the reptile house at twy cross zoo and i worked there for a number of years and then um i had a stint as a grave digger and then i went off to study zoology at leeds university and um in a break from university i was down looking for the beast of bodmin moor um in cornwall and i found a little magazine in the um potter's museum of curiosities which is sadly now disbanded and defunct but uh it used to be in the jamaica inn on bodmin moor i found this little magazine called animals and men and it wasn't as rude as it sounded uh, it was about cryptozoology and it was edited by this guy called john down and he was the head honcho of this outfit called the center for 14 zoology which was a uk-based organization that studied mystery animals so i wrote letters into this magazine subscribed to it started writing articles i met up with john downs at the 14 times unconvention and he said look when you're finished at leeds come down from yorkshire to devon and work with us at the center for 14 zoology so i did and i came down to devon uh, became the zoological director of the center for 14 zoology and since then i've been all over the world looking for creatures like the tasmanian wolf the yeti mongolian death worm giant anaconda almasti orang pendek all over the world looking for these strange creatures and writing books about it and things like that brilliant and uh, give us a, a broad outline there richard so what obviously you've just said doctor who but what was it about cryptozoology what creature tipped the balance and set you off on that journey was it the beast of bodmin moor no 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 it's long, long before that um all of them ever since i was a kid i've been fascinated with monsters and strange creatures and probably dragons were the things i've always been the most fascinated with ever since i was a child because they're found in every culture on earth and <clears throat> their lineage has been traced back over seventy-five thousand years to south africa the first images of dragons and the first dragon stories go back at least seventy-five thousand years and they're found in every culture on earth every single culture has dragons or analogues thereof cultures that never met all over the world have these stories of giant reptiles and, and you don't think it's it's early man and i don't mean that these people weren't intelligence that have just misconstrued such as the komodo dragon and turned it into some fire breathing creature or I'm, I'm, are we way off the mark with a fire breathing creature with the concept of dragons then richard well more they're more associated with water the ancient element of water worldwide uh, in the west they do breathe fire um but in most other cultures they're associated with having power over water so in china and japan their breath condenses and falls as rain and in other cultures, in, in Africa as well, and things like in Kanyamba in South Africa, that's one of the South African dragons, supposed to bring rain and they're thought to live in and around water, have power over it. And most of the ancient, very ancient dragons were actually gods, like Tiamat in Babylonian uh, legend. And she, she represented the primal chaos of the seas so it's, it's generally water, although Western dragons do indeed breathe fire. The Komodo dragon itself is a large lizard. It's about yeah. 10 feet long. It's not that big. And it's only found on a very few Indonesian islands. So it couldn't really have influenced no. very far beyond that sphere. Yeah, I just cited that as an example because I, yeah. I know that on the maps in indonesia the the old maps it will say things like there be dragons and mm. that's that's the only reason i kind of cited that mm. so where what are these what are these creatures then richard and what what makes them or what brings them into our reality are they a living breathing thing or are, are they are they real but something else they're real, I think, but something else. They're not real in the same way that a crocodile or a python is real. Now, things like crocodiles, pythons, big lizards, they have a part to play in the tapestry of it. They've been woven up into it. Also, the discovery of bones of dinosaurs, mammoths, and other large extinct animals. In China, they used to think that when the dragon shed its skin, it shed its bones, 
and grew new bones and the bones would fall to earth and turn to stone and of course they were dinosaur bones yeah and uh, today you get they, the largest crocodiles approach 30 feet long and well, even an average size crocodile will take down a lion or a tiger or even a shark they're incredibly formidable big constricting snakes again incredibly formidable in australia there used to be a um lizard called varanus priscus it was related to the komodo dragon but was much bigger um 25 30 feet long with a venomous bite uh, thought to have been become extinct at the end of the pleistocene but some people think something related to it might be hanging on in new guinea so all of this adds to it but at the core the winged fire breathing rain bringing elemental dragon is clearly something for want of a better word paranormal and they are part of what i call the global monster template you see the same kinds of monster repeated in all cultures all over the world you'll get dragons you'll get monstrous dogs like werewolves and black dogs demonic dogs you'll get monstrous cats weird big cats and humanoid cats and things like that you'll get monstrous birds like or flying things like the rock and the thunderbird and the owl man and the garuda and mothman and so forth the tengu you'll get little people goblins gnomes pixies things like that and you'll get hairy giants trolls and, and, and are all of these would you put these all in the real book from another realm that you've just been citing then well some of the things, certainly with the hairy giants, some of them are flesh and blood animals, like the orang pendek, the yeti, and so on, are flesh and blood animals. But when you have Bigfoot-like creatures turning up in places that couldn't possibly support them as biological entities, you have to look at something else. And yeah. I call this the global monster template because I was on an expedition to Thailand looking for these giant crested serpents called nagas. And I remember being in the jungle and there were these statues and um, Thailand's Buddhist, but there's a cross pollination with Hindu Hinduism there. And they had um, statues of this great serpent, the Naga, and they had the Garuda, which is like a creature, half man and half bird. And they had the Singar, which is a, a mythical lion. And I thought this reminds me of Cornwall, where they've got the sea serpent Morgar. They've got the mystery black cats and they've got the Cornish owl man. And I, that got me to thinking that these tropes are repeated again and again and again. So I thought, mm -hmm. what's behind this? What could be behind this? And it occurred to me that all of the creatures in the global monster template resemble animals that would have been preying on or in competition with our Astropithecine ancestors a couple of million years ago when they came down out of the trees onto the savannas of Africa because it was changing, the forests were shrinking, the grasslands were growing, and exploiting new new food, like carrion and things, that had been yeah. preyed on by crocodiles and pythons. Big birds of prey, like the Marshall Eagle, took them down, and we know that for that's fossilised claw marks on Australopithecine skulls. Um, African wild dogs would have hunted them, leopards and lions would have hunted them, and they would have been in competition with other primates, other types of Australopithecine, like the robust astropithecines, um, which were bigger, and other things which were smaller. And there was a giant baboon called Dinopithecus, which was almost as big as a gorilla. So it's almost as if we carry these ancient fears with us in our genes. And I think the gestalt subconscious of mankind still has these ancient terrors um, hidden within us. Have you ever been out like walking? On a nice summer's day and then the wind cuts up rough and a cloud goes in front of the sun and like a big shadow sweeps across the land and goes over you. and just for a second you like freeze as this big shadow goes over you well that I kind of freeze that. yeah that freezing behavior has been recorded in monkeys and lemurs as a um uh, a defense against birds of prey so right. It's like we've still got these ancient fears within us. And what I think yep. happens in some in some circumstances, the collective subconscious of mankind under certain circumstances can create tulpas or thought forms 
I'm glad you said that because I, 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 I was actually going to go with that. Are we creating yeah. these? Yeah, that's the two main theories I'm interested in with these really weird, weird sightings is that there's some sort of massive gestalt tulpa. The mechanism of how they're created is not fully understood, but all the circumstances, but they appear, these ancient night, and they become physically real for a time. And the other one is that they're coming from elsewhere. They're slipping in and out of some other reality. Uh, theoretical yeah. physicists have postulated, I think, 25 different dimensions. And now in um, Islam, they believe in these creatures called jinn, a race of creatures yep. called jinn. And they say that they're made out of smokeless fire, which could be translated as energy. And I've talked to Muslim people and they say that jinn come in different types. They can appear like dragons, like big hairy apes, like monstrous cats, like giant birds and like great black dogs. Which is it how we're perceiving them? Is it how, is, are they appearing then how we would want to, to shape them? Well, they, they can apparently, they can shape shift as well, but they're supposed right. to live in this other dimension that we can't normally see, but they can slip in and out. And you'll find this uh, in uh, the Hindus call them Raksashas. There was a guy just before World War I um, uh, who's a, a medium called Franek Kluski. He was a, a Polish man, and he his specialization was manifesting animals at seances. And sitters would say he would manifest this great cat like a lion that would lick their, their hands with its rough tongue. And they'd it'd manifest a huge black dog like a black shuk or a barges. And he would manifest this like ape man, this shaggy Bigfoot-like creature who was strong enough to lift up a person in a chair with one hand and he also manifested a huge bird that sat on his head so it was like he was tapping into these archetypes as well yeah yeah it's fascinating but uh, i know before we, we 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 came on air and during the week you you talked about your research when you started with the dragons so before we move on to i don't know bigfoot the werewolf stroke dogman and other cryptids that you've looked into and the giant anaconda i mean that's that's the reality of that is there but do you want to give us any examples of historic or recent sightings of these what some people would call myth mythical beasts the dragon yeah well in britain alone uh, there are over 100 dragon legends just in britain alone but yeah they're still seen in the in the modern age um 2007 october the 7th a conto falls wisconsin a group of young people have just come out from a concert. They were in a car park and they see this ball of fire shoot across the car park in the, in the sky. And they say it's orange and trailing blue flames. Then suddenly this dragon appears above them and they say it's got white scales. It has four legs, which it holds up against its body. Two massive bat like wings, a long tail with an arrowhead shape at the end, long neck with a wedge shaped head. And when it breathes fire, it's not a jet, it breathes out like a ball of fire. And they see it cross the sky, turn around, come back, so they see it twice. And one of these guys goes home, tells his family that don't believe him. And then it appears again, and his mother and his sister see it as well, flying above their house. And they say it's got, this time, it's got a couple of young ones with it, smaller ones with it. Um, white scales, pearl white scales. And... Um, they were interviewed by um, uh, an American researcher um, who wrote, uh, oh God, I hate this when someone's name goes completely out of here. Linda Godfrey, the wonderful okay. Linda Godfrey, who wrote The Beast of Bray Road. And oh, she yeah. wrote a book called American Monsters. Sadly, no longer with us, but a great researcher. And she talked to these people at length and they were terrified of what they'd seen. Amazed, but terrified. Because this thing that's supposed to exist only in legend just manifests. A friend of mine, a friend of mine called um, Lars Thomas, he's a biologist from Denmark, and he was rung up by this guy a few years ago. Do you remember when the volcano went off in Iceland and yeah, the planes were all down for a couple of weeks? Yeah, because of the plumes of smoke and everything. Yeah, yeah. it has an unpronounceable name that I'm not going to even try and say. So it, this guy told him that he was looking at this through binoculars. 
and he saw what he thought was a plane flying around. He thought, what the hell is a plane doing up there in, in the ash? And then he said he saw the plane start to beat its wings. And he said, what I was looking at was a dragon coming up out of this volcano. And he said, now, either I've gone mad or I saw a dragon. And um, that's, just, that's just a couple. There's a guy in South Africa. Yeah, yeah. Do you tell, just, just before in you South go to, Africa, they have this. Just before you jump to South Africa, just to, <laughs> you're not jumping there, are you? But just before yeah. we go to that one, you, the, the the teenagers or the, the people that claimed that they'd seen this and then told parents, yeah, and then they, yeah. the parents got to yeah. see. Do you, do you do you think that was just coincidence, or, or do you think that was meant to be because they're focusing on it? Well, a friend of a friend a friend of mine called Doc Shields. You remember the research of Doc Shields, the Irish guy. He's he's quite elderly now, but he, one of his sayings is he's an Irish bloke, and he goes. There's no such fucking thing as coincidence, he used to say. Well, yeah. I think maybe they saw it because they were meant to see it. Yeah, they thought yeah, it was on a migratory route, but I think it's linked to the witness. Somehow it's linked yeah, I, to the Yeah, I think so. I, it, because it all it almost opens a door after somebody's seen and experienced something that they, they seem to have more experiences after that. But j just before we jump to the next one, the, the light phenomena, first of all, before this this dragon or this creature was seen, they saw a ball of fiery light, amber, orange. Do, do you find that the light phenomena runs through all the genre of the unexplained? Yeah, yeah. because I'm, I've just written a book called The Highest Strangeness, which is about very, very, very high strange 14 cases in monsters, ghosts, UFOs and other areas of Fortiana. Uh, it's not out yet, but it should be out soon. And it's a whopping, yeah. uh, it's a whopping great book, four hundred odd pages of of deeply weird stuff. Yeah. And the, the thread that runs through it are balls of light. There have been cases where people have tried to photograph what looked like a bigfoot, and when the photograph came out, it was a ball of light. So seeing a uh, bigfoot has been seen holding balls of light. Um, ghosts have manifested as balls of light. Um, UFO it, it, it just okay. runs through the entire thread yeah. of it all. Yeah, it's yeah. Good. It's almost as if that, that is the baseline. That is the building blocks of the phenomenon that it uses to create. But these people said they saw the dragon actually spitting out these balls of fire. Really? It's, it's fascinating, yeah. So, sorry for interrupting you, but you were going to tell us about a, a case in, what, it's South Africa or Africa? Once again, it involves light. In South Africa, they believe in this thing called um, the flying snake, which is this gigantic dragon-like creature that's supposed to have a light glowing on its head. Um, there was a case where the son of a farmer had been attacked by one of these things, and it was investigated by Dr. Marjorie Courtney Latimer, who was the zoologist who discovered the coelacanth, the prehistoric fish we thought yeah, was extinct. Yeah. She was convinced there was something to this. And in 1977, a farmer um, said he saw one of these things attacking his sheep. And in both cases, there was a weird smell with it, like burnt tar that came with it. And he said that this thing, it looked like a dragon. It had bat-like wings, great jaws, smoke coming out of the, the nostrils, and it was biting a cow to death. Mm -hmm. And yes. another thing... Another thing that's linked up with it, then that's just a few. I've got yeah. dozens of these cases from all over the world of dragon sightings. Uh, yeah, another it, thing that's linked with it is ritual magic. Okay. Ritual magic seems to be linked with it. There's, uh, well, as in summoning these things, or, or people are, pe people involved in ritualistic magic uh, gravitate towards using the, the dragon and the symbolism of the dragon, or is it all? Oh, uh, there was a case prior to World War II in, in Russia uh, where there's a guy called Alexander Rempol, who was a Russian researcher, talked to a guy from the Russian taiga, the forests, and he said he'd seen shaman dressed up in antlers and stuff, doing some sort of ritual, and they seemed to summon this great beast he thought was a snake at first until he saw it had legs. And at that point, he freaked out and ran. Uh, Nick Redfern, you must have heard of Nick Redfern, very prolific. Oh, yeah, writer. that's Walter Rick, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
he was contacted once by a guy who said he was a farmer's son and people were ritually killing the sheep on his father's farm and Nick met, met up with him and he showed him these pictures of sheep with their throats cut arranged in circles and things and he said that he stumbled on this uh he stumbled on this organization or cult he called it the cult of the moon beast that's yep. his name this guy was called rob and he said uh they're a group of magicians and i don't mean magicians like paul daniels i mean like yeah magicians. yeah uh, well, just just be careful how we term these things, just for YouTube. But yeah, go on. Uh, you know what I'm saying, don't you? We, in case yeah. it leads to anything else. But fire away, Richard. Yeah, these were like occult, not illusion. If they were occult, yeah, yeah. And they would summon up creatures in their rituals that variously resembled dragons, werewolves, Bigfoot, and huge black dogs and huge black cats. And he said that when they first manifest they're a ball of light and then the ball of light forms itself into whatever it's going to be and these people were paid money to use these things to send these things out and scare people to death now it all sounds fantastical and strange and i wouldn't have swallowed any of it if it weren't for little things like the ball of light and the fact that these creatures are all from the global monster template now mm -hmm. nick never saw this guy again um we don't know if there's any truth in the story but they the strange parallels with other stuff now alistair crowley you know the great occultist alistair yeah, yeah. crowley he did this ritual up at uh, boleskin house near loch ness and it was a ritual called the ritual of abramelin the mage and um abramelin was supposed to have been a Egyptian magician who got this ancient ritual and it was supposed to give you a guardian angel but also bind the four dukes of hell and one of those dukes is Leviathan a great sea dragon and apparently the ritual went wrong um, a lot of Crowley's servants went mad one guy tried to attack him one guy attacked his own family and Crowley left the area and it's been postulated that whatever he did triggered the modern um, flap of sightings of the Loch Ness Monster. Right. And the house itself was then, later it was brought by um, Jimmy Page. And Jimmy Page's mate who, owned, who stayed at the house and looked after it said loads of weird things happened there. There was like um, poltergeist outbreaks, some huge beast hammering that is bedroom door one night and also a cult uh, paraphernalia has been found in the graveyard next to the Leskin house including a conch that you blow on makes a harsh brain sound red candle and an ancient Turkish um, altar cloth that had the Turkish script the dragon written on it there's an author called um, F.W. Holiday, Doc Holiday, he called himself. He, he passed away a long time ago. But he wrote this great book. If you've never read it, you can pick it up online fairly cheaply called The Dragon and the Disc. And it was about the links between UFOs and lake monsters. And he thought that the Loch Ness Monster and other lake monsters were literally evil aquatic dragons that had a baleful influence on those that saw them. And that UFOs were another part of the same phenomenon. And in the end, it led to uh, the Reverend Dr. Donald Oman actually exercising Loch Ness. He, he uh, performed this rite of exorcism at the four points of the cross and the middle of Loch Ness in 1975. It failed because people see, still see the Loch Ness monster. But he went on to try and exercise other lake monsters in um, Scandinavia and places like that. And there's a book about him called Devil Hunter by Mark Alexander another must read because it's got stories of black dogs demonic lake monsters poltergeist latter-day vampires and his involvement with them all as well well you've just touched on loch ness and i i can't imagine that you've not spent a lot of time researching and looking into that so what are your views on that what are we dealing with with the loch ness monster then richard in your opinion 
we're dealing with a lot of things um you've got to realize that it's the most famous lake in the world arguably and even if you don't believe in the monster you're going to go up there and you're thinking about the monster in the black back of your mind so if you so see a boat wake, yeah so if you see a boat wake or a seal and we know that seals get into Loch Ness or some water birds or a bunch of otters it could in your mind become a Loch Ness monster and uh, because of the way that the lake is shaped it's very v-shaped very deep it's very narrow boat wakes can hit the shore and bounce back and be visible half an hour after the boat's gone and look at look like a row of Gen most Bellamy. of it most of it is that and there's undercurrents that can drag debris along against the wind most of it is that some of it i think are gigantic eel we know that eels live in fresh water when they get ready to breed they go out to the sargasso sea i mean they don't grow genitals until they're ready to breed and we don't know what triggers that but they'll swim out to the sargasso sea they'll die after the bread and the babies will come back to the ancestral waters but sometimes you get eels that never develop and they get bigger and bigger and older and older no one knows how big and how old they get but the term for them is eunuch eel and in 2004 some canadian tourists said that they saw an eel in the shallows at long that was 24 feet long so some of these may be huge eels huge catfish huge sturgeon but also there's a paranormal element to it as well in the mix because some of the sightings have engendered deep fear in the people that saw them there's a guy called richard jenkins and his wife saw the monster from their house in in 1974 and they described it as obscene they were terrified of it and they said even after the thing was gone there was this air of evil and obscenity about the area even after it had gone and uh, fw holiday also interviewed a woman called georgina carberry who'd had an encounter with a lake monster in loch fada in ireland because it's not just loch ness they're in a lot of these deep lakes in the northern hemisphere and in the 1950s she'd been on a fishing trip with friends and she saw this creature emerge from behind an island in the loch and she said it had jaws like a shark and a long wormy serpentine body and it was coming towards them with its mouth open so they they were terrified and they packed up and went and she, she said that as they were driving away she had this feeling that somehow it was pursuing them on some psychic level it was pursuing them and she was so terrified she would never go back to the lock again even in broad daylight and he notes just how petrified she was and he finds this in in several uh, sightings of lake monsters from Loch Ness and other, and other areas there's this feeling of deep dread and that feeling of pursuit I found that in other cases as well with the owl man and with um, Bigfoot sightings there's this feeling that somehow the creature you've seen has followed you home or pursued you in some way what about then Richard Freeman personally? Have you felt that yourself uh, during any of your invested? No, never. Okay. Never, never in any of my investigations. Uh, I've ever been in a location where, as as you know, everything just descends into the lower silence and it's just a strange and eerie atmosphere? Yes, I have. I have had that. And uh, once in Mongolia, when I was looking for the Mongolian death worm, before we got into the deep desert, we were in some mountains and there was a terrible feeling of being watched by something in the mountains and i had a similar feeling in sumatra once when i was looking for the orang pendek um in the wild man of sumatra and we were in a little camp by a lake and i was a feeling one night that along the path that led down to the little clearing or in someone was watching us then in the morning fresh tiger tracks we'd been stalked by a tiger and it hadn't come right. further because of the fire in the camp so so that that answered that do you know richard you just get you touching on all of these things that, so you're giving us lots lots to sort of ask and so people in chat if you want richard to talk about a certain part of the the genre of within cryptozoology please put it forward uh, because you know, it doesn't have to be led by me because I think that Richard could talk about just about anything when it comes to cryptozoology. But you talked about the Mongolian death worm. We've got to ask about it. T -t Describe it. Tell us about some of the sightings, please. The locals call it Alroy Hoi Hoi. I oh, just said hello to my wife, Mary. But hi, Mary. So sorry, Richard, gone. <laughs> and it 
they say it looks like a length of cow's intestine. It's a reddish brown or brownish red tubular creature about as long as your arm that's supposed to come up from the the desert in the Gobi after rain and the nomads going deep terror of it and according to legend it can kill by two ways it can spit a corrosive yellow saliva at you that acts like acid or it can generate blasts of electricity powerful enough to kill a camel and uh, Roy Chapman Andrews the guy they based Indiana Jones on who was a paleontologist he heard about it when he was in the Gobi, but he didn't see one. I went over there in 2005 on an expedition for three weeks into the deep Gobi, and we travelled for about a thousand miles through the desert. And it's not just sand dunes, there are rocky areas and mountainous areas and oases and remote lakes and things that we went to. And I talked to about two dozen witnesses who all reported this sort of salami shape thing or draft excluder shape scaly um tubular hard to tell which end was the head hard to tell which end was the tail they said that the the, the electricity they call it throwing lightning that's mythological it doesn't do that but they believe it's venomous and it can spit and they're terrified of it and it can send a whole community into a panic when someone sees one we talked to one guy who said he was tending his family's camels and goats when he was a boy and he saw one of these things and he ran and told his parents they rounded up the animals packed up the gur which is the circular tents they had and moved out of the area and we had witnesses from back in the 30s right up to the year before we were there that had seen these these things and um yeah uh, one guy said he saw one grab hold of a mouse and eat a mouse uh, they've been seen coming out of holes in the desert but mostly they were just seen lying there and the people that saw them were terrified one guy was an old retired army colonel and he was near the in this base near the borders of china when we met him and he'd lived there for years he was retired now but he said in the 70s he was doing a patrol on his motorbike and he saw what he thought was a, a section of tire lying in the desert but as he got closer he saw it was the death worm and it was early in the morning and there was dew and the dew on its back was sparkling he said it was scaly and the spark sparkling and i think that's where the idea of the electricity comes from but they are terrified of it but funnily enough also in mongolia on the same expedition we heard stories of sightings of dragons really um, yeah that their equivalent to a county in mongolia is called a sum and mongolia is so huge that a sum can be the size of a small country and they have some centers which is the village that's like the center of the, the, the capitals of some and we were at one one of these sums and the, the head man there said a few years ago a doctor a traveling doctor had come to the sum because the doctors go around from place to place and uh, he said he, he went to draw well draw water from a well and he said he saw a dragon coiled up in the well and he said it had a head like a horse or a camel and a long serpentine green body with legs and we heard another story also about a dragon in a well that was supposed to have seen emerging from a well and this was back in the socialist days of um, Mongolia and the local communist officials had interpreted this as a religious story so as punishment they poured water down the well within a week of them doing it two of them were dead and the other one um, was, was impotent and struck barren and they believe it was the power of the dragon it's, it's fascinating, isn't it? You know, there's a, I think it's 1934, and you've probably yeah. heard of it, but there was a sea serpent sighting at Filey, which is a few miles yeah. from where I live. Yeah, uh, Filey Bridge. Yeah, that, that, yeah, well, it, it was actually in the bay, uh, in, in, yeah. in the bay of, which Filey Bridge runs out a mile, doesn't it, off, yeah. off, off, offshore. But what was interesting, uh, it, were, it was seen by a, a coast guard if i'm if i remember correctly but yeah. he said he had a head like a horse you know and yeah. you just touched on that then and uh and, and then you've got the kelpies which are kind of horse-headed beasts aren't mm. they you know so it's yeah. fascinating richard but do you know you t sticking with this mongolian death worm what a what a what a name and i, I just want to touch on something briefly is this do you believe that then this is just some undiscovered creature yeah it's a flesh and blood animal yeah most of the stories that are attached to it are apocryphal 
Mm. But I said if I saw one, because I I've, ha I've handled reptiles all my life, I would try and catch it, bring it mm. back. Because I think it's probably the the spitting acid is probably a folk tale, and the generating blast of electricity certainly is a folk tale. I think it's one of two things. It's either a Anthisbana or worm lizard, and these are these weird um, sausage-shaped reptiles. That are, they're not snakes and they're not lizards, they're in a little group of their own. And I think it could, could be a very large one of them. And they live yeah. mostly underground. Or it's a sandboa, an undiscovered species of sandboa, which are small constricting snakes um, that live in generally in arid areas. So it could be an undiscovered one of those. But interestingly, in um, I think it's Somalia in Africa, the sandboa that they have there, the Kenyan sandboa, they call it the apris. And the local people think that it's so venomous and so deadly that it doesn't even have to bite you. If it touches you, you'll fall down dead. And in fact, it's completely harmless. Uh, right. So it's not something, something secretion on its skin that could harm anybody. No, it's absolutely it's, harmless. It's, 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 do, you, I've, I've, do you think there could be such creatures as this Mongolian death worm? And I don't mean that that's in the UK, but do you think there's creatures undiscovered in the United Kingdom, I've got a reason for asking you that. But do you think there's anything out there on in the land, UK on land? Only very small things like insects mm. and invertebrates on land. There was a new species of bats discovered a few in near Bristol actually a few years yeah. ago, and this species of bat was discovered. But we're not talking I've... about anything big. Well, I just want to run this one past you and anybody else that's listening. I've got a the Flixton Star Car. You've, you've probably heard of it, Richard. It's But it, it used to be Lake Flixton. It's a Mesolithic, it's a dried up lake bed. It's still very yeah. marshy ground. And I've got a friend who has a property. I'm not going to say where, but it's on, it's very, it's on the edge of Flixton Star Car and it's a remote area. This guy says to me, and he's got a huge garden, acres of garden, and he's laid on a sun lounger in his garden several years ago and I said I'm just laid there just relaxing and I see this thing come up out of the grass stand up right about nine to ten inches he says about as thick as a brush hand you know stick what, what, what do you call them a brush handle and yeah. he said it, and it, it, it almost looks gossamer and transparent but I, but it's clearly there he said, and I'm mesmerised, he says, but I get up and walk towards it and it just, and it's gone. He said, I've been at my kitchen window and I've seen it again or seen another one since. And he says, he just says it just comes up out of the grass. He says, and there's a little hole where it's where it's come up from. And I've never heard anything like that. And when you look at the Flixton cars and it's this, this sort of, this lake bed and very, very barren, uh, it's one of the most important archaeological sites in the United Kingdom. Uh, so it's it's untouched land, you know, a bit of farming, cattle on it and what have you, but it's it's all moist. They, they say that a herd of cattle running along it in certain places, the ground still wobbles because obviously you're on this lake. But what are the chances of something like something undiscovered being in a place like that? I, I, I believe he's seen it. I believe this guy's seen it. If it lives underground and it's an invertebrate and it's not massive it's very small then yeah that could be that could be something yeah you, you know it, it, it all stuck with me when he told me he'd seen this thing I, it, he's got a wife as well she's not seen it but he's he said i've never ever laid on the grass since he went on a sun lounger when he saw it the first time he said i've never laid on the grass or anything so really peculiar thing he says and as you approach it it literally just and it's gone uh, but it's it's stuck up out of the ground like a tube so it's clearly something living. That is a really weird story. Really yeah, weird. yeah. I can get you more information on that if you want. Yeah. Uh, or I can endeavour to. So uh, we're not ready for questions yet, but we will be shortly. So um, where are we going with this then? We'll touch on the uh, on your research into the, is it the Aran Pandek? The Aran Pandek, yeah. The, the two creatures I've been most associated with are the Tasmanian wolves which is a flesh-eating marsupial from Tasmania, and the Orang Pendek, which is an upright walking ape from the jungles of Sumatra. And I've been an upright what? Sorry, Richard, an upright what? An upright walking ape. Oh, I, I thought you said wolf and ape. Apologies. Sorry, you're walking no. ape. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I've been over there 
six times now and I've talked to loads of people that have seen this. And um, there was a, a British woman, she's retired now, she's called Debbie Martyr. She's back in England now, but for, for a long time, for many years, she lived in Sumatra and she was the head of the uh, Indonesian Tiger Conservation Group. And she saw the Orang Pendek twice, close up. Um, it's been seen by a wildlife photographer who didn't manage to get a snap of it. Um, one of the guys on my expedition, a guy called Dave Archer, first expedition he was on, first day in the jungle, he sees the damn thing. He's there with um, a uh, uh, the, our, our native guide, and they see this thing crouching in a tree. And he said it's got hair, black hair, very like a mountain gorilla. It's about five feet tall, but very broad and powerfully built. Remarkably human-looking face, and it was hiding in the tree trying not to be seen and when it realized it had been seen it looked afraid came down from the tree and walked away on two legs on another occasion i, fa I found the handprints of it uh, the footprints of it i've heard it call and the call is really weird do you remember a rather camp rather preachy cartoon in the 1980s called he-man and the masters of the universe uh, yeah 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 do you remember the villain, Skeletor? He had this high pitched yes, laugh. Yeah. Well, the Orang Pendex vocalization sounds like Skeletor's laugh. It sounds daft, but that's what it sounds like. Um, right. The last time I was there, I was about 20 foot away from one behind a stand of bamboo. I just missed seeing it. A colleague of mine had a glimpse of it as it disappeared into the forest. But we found the footprints, the handprints. We found hair, and the hair was looked at by Lars Thomas, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, the Danish biologist, and he's an expert in mammal hair. And he looked at uh, the hair, couldn't get any DNA out of it, but he looked at the structure of it and he said, This thing is related to the Sumatran orangutan, but it's different. It's not the Sumatran orangutan. So, what I think the orang pendek is, is a ground dwelling, upright species of orangutan. Now, until recently, we thought there were two species of orangutan, the Borneo and the Sumatran. But 2017 they found a third type the tapanuli orangutan also on sumatra so it's far from impossible there's a fourth type of small upright walking orangutan that lives on the forest floor don't live in the trees like the other orangutans it lives on the forest floor so, yeah, yeah, to find a third one after after how many years of researching and searching for these yeah. these orangutans uh, how many years did it take to find the third uh, separate species it wasn't confirmed till 2017. And not long before that, they found a population of gorillas in Africa, the Cross River gorillas. And gorillas are massive animals. They live in big groups and they're noisy and flatulent. And uh, these gorillas have remained hidden and, you know, until I think it was first decade of, of this century. Really? I think I think yeah. I go up with a troop of them. The yeti doesn't seem so. The yeti doesn't seem so um, impossible. I've been on the no. track of the yeti in India, and I've found its footprints. And I've talked to people who've seen it, and they all describe the same animal: three meters tall, covered in black hair, and looking like a, an upright walking gorilla. A gorilla. I'd, a huge gorilla. I'd love to talk about that when we've done questions, if possible, Richard. But yeah. sticking with the the creature in Sumatra, is there any? Are there any reports of it being aggressive towards people? Not usually, no. It tries to get out of people's way. Uh, there's one story about when they were making the Trans-Sumatran Highway. They were whacking a, a road through the jungle. Some of them came out of the jungle and threw sticks at, at, the, at the machines. Occasionally, they'll, they'll whip a rock or a stick at something that they think is a threat. But usually, they just go out, out, out of the way. One guy, one of the, the Kubu people who were the Aborigines of um, Sumatra, he said one of them charged at him once. He saw it. He said it had a face like a monkey. It had this reddish brown hair, about four feet tall, very broad. And he said that um, it lifted its arms up above its head. That's what they do when they try and make themselves look bigger, if they think something's a threat. And it charged at him like that, and he ran away. But usually they, they see you and they just hightail it yeah 
You, you, you touched on one of the the naturalists, is that the word, not naturists, uh, who, who had actually seen one of these things, uh, yeah. one of these creatures. But what about what about other researchers, like more more notable researchers of of the natural world of of sort of na tigers, giraffes, chimpanzees? Have, has any of them shown an interest in the crypt, the creatures of cryptozoology? Yeah, well, there's a, there's a number of um, mainstream scientists that over the years have taken an interest. Uh, there's a friend of mine called Darren Nash, who's a paleozoologist. He came on my last expedition to look for the Caspian tiger, which is a species of tiger that's supposed to be extinct from Central Asia. But we've spoken to so many people that have seen them and seen them recently that it looks like they might still be around. So, I mean, he's broadly sceptical but open to certain things. Uh, Dr. Jeff Meldrum um, yeah. uh, from um, Idaho University, he's pretty much sold on the existence of Sasquatch in North America. Um, Jane Goodall, the chimpanzee. Um, That's where I was leaning. I, won't, I, I, would, yeah. I was hoping you were going to say that. Yeah, yeah. The Yeti uh, and the Sasquatch here. Yeah. That's fascinating. Well, I think we can... Uh... If Les has got some questions, maybe... Are you happy to answer some questions, Richard? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Superb. And more questions in capital letters, please, for uh, Richard. And it's great because uh, it's putting a completely different slant on what we normally talk about. It's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, some great reactions tonight. Uh, and I think if I can put one on the screen... Oh, where did I see it? It's further down there. We'll go a bit of encouragement for, to, yeah. for, uh, for us all. Dragonborn saying this is brilliant tonight. Thank you, uh, Dragonborn. Thank you. Much appreciated. Yeah. Good name as well. Uh, yeah, well, it, it's in keeping with what yeah, we've been yeah. talking about. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll start uh, a question from Rick Allen then. Uh, why does Richard think that none of the cryptids, such as Dogman, do not appear in the fossil record? Well, um, I think, first of all, I think. Dogman is not a flesh and blood animal anyway. I think it's a paranormal creature, so it wouldn't yeah. appear in the fossil record. Um, the fossil record is far from complete. Ask any paleontologist. If an animal dies, usually its flesh and bones are scavenged very quickly. In order to become a fossil, there has to be a, a certain set of circumstances. It has to be preserved without being torn apart and eaten by scavengers, and it has to be in a <clears throat> um, condition where the bones are going to be preserved and eventually what happens is fossilization the bones uh, the minerals in them are leached out and replaced with stone so very few animals actually make it into the fossil record so the fossil record is far from complete that's why we're finding new species of, of animal from the fossil record all the time and also in genetics as well we, we used to think that um, the ancestors of man uh, it was a straight lineage and Neanderthal man was our ancestor and Homo erectus was the ancestor of Neanderthal man and so forth. And the straight line, you must have seen the progression of man, the, the picture yep. of them. Yep. Now we know it's nothing like that. It's a tangled bush, a new, rather than a tree, and new species of hominin uh, from the fossil record are turning up all the time. But also in genetics, because there's been genetic studies on certain populations of people that have genetic markers uh, from around the world, that have genetic markers to suggest that their ancestors mated with forms of hominin, which is a relative of one of the ancestors of man, forms of hominin that we haven't even got the bones for yet. So all we've got of them is genetic markers. And some of these hominins or relatives of them are likely to still be around in remote places uh, around the world. Thank you. Okay. And... Uh... Uh, 180 full swing here from Silver Fox. Uh, Richard is absolutely bang on the money concerning Doctor Who nowadays. So, yeah, I agree. So, going back to your Doctor Who comments. Well, good. <laughs> well said, mate. Jimmy Jumper at Wilka any day. <laughs> uh, okay. And uh, let's have a look then. Uh, we've got is this uh, Andrew Sheehan. What would Richard say is the most commonly reported sighting of cryptids in the UK? The big cats. 
I mean, they're not really a cryptid. They're just out of place animals. But big cats are the most commonly sighted thing in the UK. I mean, there are reports of them every few weeks. And I've seen one myself. I saw one from a coach in broad daylight in Devon. Then in the field, it was a puma. And I know what I'm looking at because I used to be a zookeeper. And I examined a kill uh, in North Devon a few years ago that was typical cat. It was a, a ram that had had its neck dislocated. The fleece had been peeled back like you were peeling the skin off a kipper or a banana and the bones picked clean. Similar to kills I've seen in Africa. And that was undoubtedly the work of a big cat. So, yeah, I know big cats have even been caught. 1980, they caught a puma in a, in a cage trap in uh, Inverness and she lived the rest of her life quite comfortably in the Highland Wildlife Park. They called her Felicity. Okay, uh, I'll move on with this question. Rick Allen is saying the witnesses in Wolflands, that's the uh, film uh, Paul and I made, uh, were not manifesting anything. They were seeing real flesh and blood entities. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that they were, Rick, in some instances. Yeah. But obviously, let, let, let You're not saying that these things are like ghosts and that they're immaterial. Uh, we're, we're talking about something that is physically real for at least a time, and they're either coming in from another dimension, they're walking in from another dimension, scaring the, the Jesus out of people, and then going mm. back again, or there's some sort of tulpa. But if there was something like that living in the north of England, we'd know about it by now, if they were yeah. there all the time, because you can't just have one, you've got to have a base population, and these things have got to feed, they're going to defecate, they've got to breed. Britain is one of the most um, badly deforested countries in, in the whole of Europe and a lot of the forests we've got now are just pine plantations which are very very biologically impoverished we've lost most of our great forests so like people who say that Bigfoot lives in Britain well no it can't it would have been discovered centuries ago and probably hunted into extinction my, my mate John Downs um, he saw a, a weird Bigfoot-like creature in Bolam Lake uh, years ago when we went up to investigate sightings of Bigfoot-like creatures in this, this place called Bolam Lake, which is a country park not too far outside of Newcastle Town Centre. You're not mm -hmm. telling me that a group of seven-foot-tall eight men uh, are living near Geordie Central and nobody knows about it. Mm -hmm. And he said the thing that he saw, it was moving like speed, speeded up film like it was speed up film and it looked two-dimensional it looked flat it looked like a he described it as a man-shaped hole in reality and one of the other witnesses we talked to a woman called naomi and a teenage son they said they'd come to investigate because they'd heard these stories and they saw this great hairy figure standing in the forest several hundred feet away from them and it made a noise and they said that it reminded them of chewbacca in star wars the noise it made and the actual vocalizations of chewbacca were an american black bear that's what they used for them and, uh, but they said they had a feeling that even though it was standing still it was somehow rushing at them and they got very, very frightened got into the car and drove away and they had this feeling that it was somehow pursuing them again the pursuit there's a case from australia where the the wild man is called the yowie and uh, my friend um the, the great uh Australian cryptozoologist Tony Healy investigated it and it was some teenagers who had seen these things and were hysterically frightened and when their mum had come to pick them up and drove away they said they had the feeling that somehow it was pursuing them coming after them the, one of the witnesses another guy I know personally who's seen the owl man of Mornan the creature that's similar to the North American mothman it's seen it in Mornan Smith in Cornwall he said that he, he, he was on holiday there with his girlfriend. He saw this thing. It terrified him. And he said that somehow he felt that it followed him home, hundreds of miles home, and it was lurking in the woods outside of his house. And he kept glimpsing it. Somehow he was glimpsing this thing. So again and again, we get this idea of pursuit, that these things can somehow psychically chase after you. Mm. Uh, yeah. I I'm kind of with you on that, you know, I call it the intermind connection. It's almost as though when you've had this experience and I've spoke to witnesses, one in particular were telling us about 
this werewolf type entity that he saw on his ha- on his neighbor's house roof. And it's only a recent one that I've talked about. Les Les knows about this yeah, one. Sure, and yeah. But he said when he and, and there were years in between seeing it, Richard. But he said when he decided he was going to talk to me about it, he almost got the feeling that. It flickered his eyelids if that's and he didn't say that, but it, it, it was aware, it's it, almost like a reconnection with the phenomena. And I call it a phenomena, but and you might not, but to me, uh, uh, this thing cannot be real in the true sense of the word. But mm. anyway, we're here for questions, so and it's for Richard, not me. Go on, let's. Is, yeah, it's another question, question from uh, is Rick Allen? Yeah. Is he only person? Rick Allen, questions? yeah, I've only got Rick Allen questions tonight. It looks like, yeah, but, but I, I can, yeah, there's a few on I can see, but yeah, go on, yeah. Well, I, I, I'm going order, and that's the way I can, yeah, fair you enough. Know, yeah, why does Richard <laughs> think the dragon slash serpent was present in the Bible? Uh, because people back then were seeing them, they're present in most of. The holy books and old scriptures um the, in the, the, the hebrew yahweh uh there's a theory that yahweh and god are not the same thing because yahweh there's a description of yahweh t- saying he has this great long face and smoke and fire come from his nostrils and he's this thing that goes out and smites and destroys and there's a theory that yahweh is a dragon and this stretches all the way back to babylon and tiamat in babylon and Samaria and further back into the reaches of time they've, they've always been there and that's why they they turn up in all this ancient literature the um anglo-saxon chronicles um they report dragons flying around above lindisfarne you know, on bat-like yeah. wings you know, having great long heads and snouts and... Mm. okay i'll move on with uh not from rick allen it's from tina uh, question, Richard. Have you covered the yeah, covered that was, talking Mongols? Yeah. That was going to be a question, but you can you can either touch on it now and we'll cover it in detail, or it's up to you. Yeah. Jeff oh. is the poster boy of Fortiana. What a great case that was. Yes, I've been to Cashin's Gap to where um, the farmhouse was. There's nothing left of it now except the Mrs. Irving's gooseberry bushes. Um, sadly, we thought there'd be some, even the foundations of God. Well, I'll be, I'm going back to the Isle of Man in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, I, I love the place. Yeah, Jeff was one of the most fantastic stories ever. And it, I've got a whole section on him in my new book, The Highest Strangers, and other talking animals as well. The idea that it was some sort of hoax with ventriloquism and Bore, the young girl, was doing the ventriloquism. Well, people heard Jeff talk when Bore wasn't anywhere near the farm. And other people, other than the Irvings, reported seeing Jeff as well. So I don't think Jeff the Talking Mongoose was a hoax. He could have been a another tulpa, or uh, Nandor Fodor thought he was an actual mongoose that had been possessed by a split-off part of Jim Irving's personality. Uh, if you've seen the film Nandor Fodor and the Talking Mongoose, it's garbage. It has nothing to do with the actual story whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you want the, the, the best resources, is Christopher Josephy's book on just jeff the talking mongoose which is absolutely great but yeah jeff jeff is amazing and the last time we were there we held a seance to try and raise jeff and the planchette was just talking nonsense it was not making any any sense whatsoever so we packed it up so i went off to bed and i was sharing the room with my friend jackie and her bed was about 10 feet away from mine and she said she woke up in the middle of the night and there was something or other jumping around on my bed. She could hear it. The sound of a small animal jumping around on my bed. And it seemed to be going round and round the bed, the edge of the bed, in a circle. And I was moving my arms and my legs in my sleep out of its way as it was coming around. So I was at, reacting to whatever it was in my sleep. But it sounded like a small animal jumping around. So was that Jeff? Who knows? Interesting. Well, we might touch on Jeff uh, yep. after um, this. We'll we'll go to Les, uh, the talking yep. uh, question from uh, Karen Beerman. Richard, is there sightings reported of the phoenix in the UK? Agreed. Not so far as I know. Now, the phoenix um, was supposed to be a singular creature. It wasn't a whole race of things. It was a singular, the Middle Eastern phoenix. 
and it was supposed there was only ever supposed to be one that lived in a temple and when it was ready to die but a very long lifespan it would cause its mess material to ignite and it would burn itself to death and in the ashes there would be a new egg and the phoenix would hatch out and rise again so there's only ever one the asian phoenix um in japan and uh, china was probably it's totally different it's supposed to be a great tall thing with a long neck and long legs uh, that laid big eggs and that was probably based on the now extinct mongolian ostrich uh -huh. right. there are certain things like you, you still get sightings of dragons yeah. and there are still sightings of fairies and things and trolls and stuff like that as far as i know there are no convincing sightings of say unicorns or phoenixes um okay so it seems that some things persist and some some don't yeah yeah uh martin abbas is asking uh, could all the cryptids be the same entity just presented in different ways i know you touched on this earlier uh if yeah. you want to add to that yeah uh, not the flesh and blood ones the flesh and blood ones are different types of animal so if we're talking about the paranormal ones possibly possibly they could be uh i have a theory that these balls of light are what researchers call paul Devereux call earth lights which are balls of plasma which are released in certain conditions certain tectonic conditions the theory is and there's been some research in Romania about how they react and they they seem to react like living things like their cells when there's a group of them together they they act as one so they're almost forming like cells forming a body so could these balls of light be earth lights and that is the raw material from which the entities build their bodies Okay, so could you imply oh, so not not the earth not the earth light having intelligence as such then intelligent uh, light intelligent light forms so you're not saying it, that then well, they seem to think there's some sort of rudimentary intelligence but they're acting like cells hmm. acting like living it, things it, it, it is interesting yeah, yeah yeah okay i'll move on with another question adam sander uh do you think that some cryptic cryptids have a function or a task here in our realm oh, that's an interesting question uh, yeah. john downs came up with this idea and he, he thought that a lot of not all but a lot of window areas where the flaps go on forty and flat uh they're places are that were formerly places of worship so there are places that were once um temples or churches were there uh, or priests of whatever religion were worshipping there and when they fall out of use these things start to manifest and his theory is that somehow they feed on fear or attention or confusion and when that's not being given to them as worship they will go out and frighten and baffle and that's how they get their power that's John Downsy's take on it. Yeah, because it does a lot of it does seem to be fear based, doesn't it? You know, there's a lot of yeah, a lot of fear generated when or, or people feel it when they're seeing these things. Mm. Okay, Les. Okay, I'll put this out from Mark Jones. Richard, what is your favorite book on cryptids? Ooh, there's so many to choose from. Um, I really like Tony Healy and Paul Cropper's out of the shadows the mystery animals of australia which is very hard to get these days it goes for a bomb um that is absolutely great uh janet and colin boards um alien animals is a very good one bernard hoivelman's classic on the track of unknown animals fantastic so there, there are heaps of them i, I could i could talk about but uh Excellent. Tony Healy and Paul Cropper have done some great work. There's been a, a, a couple of books on the Australian Yowie, the Australian Wild Man. Um, and they've done a, a book on the Australian Poltergeist as well, which is fantastic, and includes one where a Yowie, an Australian Wild Man, turns up in the middle of a haunting. There's this farmhouse haunted by a poltergeist, 
one night this thing barges through the door grabs a woman by the by the leg and tries to haul her away and another time she wakes up and it's there looking at her in, in bed and that's not the only time bigfoot's turned up during hauntings there's a case from america where there's a poltergeist outbreak and this big red eyed bigfoot would appear in the house and then like walk through walls like a ghost uh, the the famous epworth priory haunting from the 18th century one of the things seen there was this great hawking figure with red eyes which these days would be interpreted as a bigfoot and bigfoots have been seen in ufo cases there's one case where there were two um big cats seen with a bigfoot and weird lights at the same time and the bigfoot was standing between the cats and the humans as if it was protecting them like it it was their pets so you've got all these phenomena lumped in together uh we we erect these barriers we say, oh, this is ufology this is parapsychology ghosts this is cryptozoology and in reality they sort of lead into each other oh yeah, it's spot on. A, yeah. a case case uh, from america i think it was where was it in a, it might have been nebraska i can't remember there's a, a ufo landed in a graveyard and when the people saw it the doors opened up on the side of it and out come loads of these huge demonic black dogs like the barges or a black shook the famous todd morden case of the policeman um godfrey his name was pt godfrey who got kidnapped he said when he went under hypnotic regression as well as these weird little robots and this christ-like figure on the in a spaceship there was a black dog what's that doing there Mm. Yep, it, it, it doesn't fit, but it does fit because these reports and, and just keep cropping up time and time again. It might fit with what Martin Abbas said earlier. Uh, you know, are these things all things to all men? And it, it, the paranormal element is it, as Barry Fitzgerald would say, and Steve Mira just put presenting with a different mask. Yeah. I don't know. Seeing, seeing UFOs as intelligent aliens coming from another another uh, planet over the vast distances of space of interstellar space coming to earth it makes no sense because they just they're not they're, they're selecting people on back roads and stuff and remote houses yeah. and dicking about there's no impact all the, all is the, there yeah like the, the, people the famous mm. case of the hopkins all goblins these goblin like entities that turned up at a place called kelly in in near hopkinsville um uh in kentucky and terrorized this house and are crawling over the the roof and reaching in with claw-like hands and bullets didn't seem to affect them at all and uh they're acting more like folkloric bogeymen than aliens mm. why would an intelligent life form come and 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 the proclamation they give to people they give them they give them all these warnings and nothing ever comes to fruition, does it? With yeah. the goblin uh, case, they, weren't they shooting at them all night with to no effect? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, allegedly, you know, yeah. But most of oh. these, most of these creatures, when they've been shot at, it has no effect whatsoever. The, the mm. monster of Loch Borrar um, collided with a, a a boat in 1969, and they shot at it with rifles. There's no. No effect whatsoever. Yeah. Some of the big there's a str effect. strange thing then when you say it collided with the vault, you're it's implying that there's a physical. It's a oh yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah. Oh, but the bullets, but the bullets have no effect. It's it's weird, yeah. isn't it? You know, it's well, it could be uh, the animal is too big, big and powerful and muscular, and its hide is too thick. Um mm. or it could be that it's something paranormal. Yeah. So go on, Les. Okay. I think it was uh Probably a general question to the people in the chat, but you can answer this one yourself. Has anyone read Andrew Collins' book, The Seventh Sword? I haven't, no. Is this, is this where all, this, all the... the uh, I, I, I haven't, and I, I don't think... Uh, King Arthur's you... Sword, yeah. It's, uh... No, all right, okay. we'll move on from that. If anybody else has read it in the chat, uh, that'd be good if they could... Uh... Tell us what it was like. We'll right. get Andrew on. I spoke to him the other day. Yeah. So we... Okay. So, moving on. Uh, just bear with me. Frozen up a little bit. There. Right. Here we go. 
Saint Dean Columbus. Moonson is asking, uh, well, he's saying St. Columbus saw something in the Loch Ness as well. So the Loch Ness monster. Yeah, it's the river Ness which runs into Loch Ness. But yeah. The story is he was there converting the pits and he saw them burying a man and they said that he'd been bitten to death by a, a water monster. And so he encouraged one of the other men to swim across the river Ness and this thing emerged. He made the sign of the cross and it fled back into the water. But that sounds to me rather like an allegorical story about a missionary that they've yeah. made up to, you know, sell yeah. their God, basically. I would agree. Than... Okay, I'll put this one on the screen, but I know we've just covered this one. Saxon Crew is asking, what do you think the Dogman is? Well, the interesting thing about Dogman um, is that they in no way resemble actual werewolves from medieval legend because in medieval european legend a werewolf is a person who transforms entirely into a wolf it's not this man wolf hybrid that walks around on two legs like a big hairy man with a wolf's head it looks like any other wolf uh, except for perhaps weird behavior and the stories were that you were either under a curse by a sorcerer or a witch or you were given a magic belt or jacket yeah. By a sorcerer or the devil and it gave you the power to turn into a wolf yeah. now those original stories may have started with rabies so it could be that a wolf with rabies mm. approaching humans it would usually stay away with biting them and then passing on the, the rabies to them so they would go mad that was probably where the original idea of the werewolf came from but the dogman thing is totally different and it wasn't until uh the 1930s with films like the werewolf of london and the wolf man with lon cheney jr i always think he looked a bit more like a yorkshire terrier than a wolf in that film <laughs> i keep expecting to go <laughs> sausages <laughs> but um the, the idea of the the man wolf hybrid that we get today um but sightings of those things go back to the 1930s in, in, in America. So they're very different from the medieval werewolf. Uh, I think mm, they're okay. something paranormal. They're a manifestation from the global monster template. Yeah, no, we'll touch on that. And it's kind of the whether these things are guardians of the dead or anything. But we'll, don't answer that yet. We'll just uh, see whether okay. there's uh, any more questions. Some more questions for later if you want me to save them and you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little bit yeah. later. I've got to thank uh, Karen Beeman for the monetary comp contribution to uh, the stream tonight. Thank you, uh, Karen, as always. Thanks for that. Generous. Uh, right then, I'll disappear and I'll be back shortly. Okay, Les. Well, we've touched on loads and loads of things, uh, different different types of uh, strange creatures, and it, you, you've delved into everything. But what about stories probably one of the, that i find particularly terrifying and it could be a creature that that's just not been discovered giant spiders that people have reported over the years and i'm talking about huge spiders You've, you will have knowledge of this richard i'm sure yeah yeah there are from the congo there are stories of these huge spiders as big as small people that make yeah. immense webs and the stories from new guinea as well but the thing is spiders like all arthropods they have an exoskeleton and you can only get so big with an exoskeleton before you can't move the biggest arthropod on land is the coconut crab or the robber crab which is about a meter across yeah and if you get much bigger than that not only can you not move you can't breathe because they breathe this spiral cord these little openings between the joints and the uh, exoskeleton and they only work up to a certain level so a spider of that size wouldn't be able to move or breathe so all these films like tarantula and the black scorpion and deadly mantis of the 1950s those those creatures wouldn't be able to move or breathe they couldn't exist okay so so as regards the, the accounts of them if you'd got some what, what you thought were genuine witnesses in the com, coming out of the congo these stories you wouldn't be inspired to go and research it or or search for it no i'm always careful about what i spend my money on because mounting an expedition costs an arm and a leg yeah, yeah. I mean, ideally i'd like to be out there for months or years but i can only go for two or three weeks due to funding it all comes down to the folding green stuff in the end yeah uh, 
I have to um, select cryptids that I think I've got a fighting chance of finding. Ones that I think exist and I've got a fighting chance of finding. Like the Tasmanian wolf. Flesh-eating marsupial from Tasmania. Looks like a dog with tiger-like stripes down the back. Also known as a thylacine. They were supposed to have been hunted to extinction in the 1930s, but there's been thousands of sightings of them. Uh, one was seen by a, a park ranger. One was seen by a zoologist called Hans Nardin. And I've been over there now three times. And I've spoke to witnesses. And the thing about Tasmania is it's about the size of Ireland. Its population is less than half a million. Most of those are in Launceston or Hobart. When you get to the west of the island, there's massive, a massive of wilderness. And I, I talked to a guy who said he'd been driving to work with his colleagues one morning. There were five of them in his car. And this thing came out into the road in front of them and they all saw it clearly. And it was a Tasmanian wolf. Another guy was driving between Hobart and Launceston. And he said he saw it running along the side of the road, him and his wife. And there was another car drew up behind him and they saw it and they went and reported it. And there was a news story about it. And I've, I've spoke to so many people with no axe to grind that have seen this thing. Yeah. Uh, people back in the day, at the time when it officially existed, it was supposed to have been hunted to extinction in the 1930s. But those who remember it said it had a smell very like a hyena. Now, I know what a hyena smells like. I was out in the wilderness in a remote part of Tasmania once along this path in the, the forest. And I got this smell just like a hyena, like something had just crossed a few minutes before and left the scent behind it. I'm pretty damn sure it's still around in Tasmania yeah. and possibly, well, more than possibly, most likely in the, the mountain forests of New Guinea as well, because it used to be all across Tasmania, mainland Australia and New Guinea. Oh, and what? Can, what size would this animal have been, uh, Richard? It's about the size of an Alsatian. Right, okay. And and same characteristics as a, a wolf. It would be a pack animal, would it? Or yeah. I, I, no, no, no. solitary? No. It's, it's, they, they hunted alone or in pairs. They outwardly look like a wolf or a dog, but the biology is very different. They're a marsupial. They raise their young in pouches. And their jaws open far wider than a, a wolf or a dog. And their bite was more powerful than a wolf or a dog. But their skulls weren't adapted for hanging on to struggling prey. Now, when wolves in packs hunt large prey, they'll all get round it and they'll hang on to it and they'll harry it and worry and it. And just drag it, it down. It alive. The Tasmanian wolf was different. It bit. We think it bit. It had a big, devastating, crushing bite and then let go and the prey would bleed to death. And then it would, yeah. then it would eat it. Okay. So, so, jumping back to... Werewolf stroke, dogman. Do you find locate certain locations are throwing these 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 creatures or these creature sightings up constantly, not just in the UK but all around the world? Do you think that or, or certain landmarks that people place, such as burial mounds, standing stones? Do you find do you sign do you see see or hear of cryptid reports around those locations? Yeah, um, I think I think it was Avebury. Nick Redfern was told a story by a, a guy who used to work for the Ministry of Defence. And he heard about this old lady that had been walking through the stones one evening and she saw a ball of light, about head height, um, golden coloured. And she said it seemed to split apart and like a liquid came from it and it fell to the floor. And out of this liquid, this serpentine creature appeared with these big bulging eyes. And she was terrified and, and ran off home. A lot of the the wolf, the dogman sightings in America have been around old burial mounds, native mm. burial mounds. So there uh, seems to be window areas, uh, but also they turn up randomly as well. They'll turn up, they'll randomly, did you say? Some, yeah, sometimes some yeah. people turn up randomly and never be seen before or yeah. after. But but uh, like you, I do think I, I agree that, that there are random sightings, and we get these locations where you'll never see it again. But certain areas, there's a burial mound here in East Yorkshire called Willy Howe. Uh, mm -hmm. I haven't got a cryptid sighting there, but we've got UFO reports. We've got reports of the Fay, all all manner of unexplained phenomena around this burial mound, and and you know, 
you must have you must have well the Fay. what's your views what are we dealing with there then richard have you looked into that at all yeah. and i've had my own experience oh well here we go let's listen to this please it was the year 2000 and it was on dartmoor uh, in devon which is a wild rugged area with lots of strange stories of legends of dragons up there and pixies and black dogs all sorts of things ghosts the hairy hands which were supposed to manifest and disembodied big hairy hands manifest and grab hold of steering wheels and drive cars off the road it's it's one of those window areas there's a big stone circle called Skorl up there and this is 24 years ago now but on a whim it wasn't planned on a whim three friends and i decided to go up there one evening and take a look at it and it was in late october early november <coughs> and we drove up there and there is a car park near to it a couple of hundred yards away but we didn't know that at the time because we'd never been before and nobody had mobile phones and stuff back then so we just drove up we parked up somewhere randomly and we started walking across the fields towards it and it was still light we came to this field and it wasn't a big field but it was enclosed by a dry stone wall we went through the gate closed the gate again behind us we're walking across this field and then we couldn't find the gate at the other side and we were walking around this field for ages looking for the gate on the other side and there was a weird feeling of woolly headedness and a feeling like you were walking through treacle a very odd almost dreamlike sensation I noticed it was getting dark. I thought, hang on, how long have we been in here? It, it, you know, it's dark now. And it was light when we came in. And it wasn't a very big field. It's not going to take us that long to walk across it. I thought, what the hell's going on? Why can't we find our way out? And by the dry stone wall appears a circle of lights. And they reminded me of the lights you get on a big wheel up there. There are, there are a circle that was about five feet across, made up out of these little lights each about the size of a thumbnail and they were um, sort of blue white in colour. I said look at that, everybody saw it and then the lights winked out and they came back on again in the shape, the outline of a person. Now you know the signs on public toilets of a man and a woman? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the man's got like, his arms and legs next to him like that. In some that they're standing with the legs apart and somebody's yep. standing with their legs together it's standing with its legs together and it's like an outline and the, the head looked like it was sunken down into the shoulder and it was still it didn't it didn't move it was just hanging in midair it was about five feet tall um do you remember the old gray whistle test yes do you remember they used to have the guy made up out of dots yeah and out, but yeah it was like that but it looked like the sign on a, on a public toilet I, look at that everyone saw it and it went out again i thought something's really weird going on here and then i remember the stories about pixies on dartmoor that are supposed to cast a spell over you and let lead you astray and the way to break it is to take your coat off turn it inside out and put it on again so i said to these other three people everybody take your jackets off turn them inside out and put them on again which is a really weird thing to ask anybody to do isn't it but yeah, nobody I mean, it's probably a bit last thing that you were ever going to think you were going to be suggesting that day, weren't it, or that yeah. evening? Yeah, but no one said, Rich, have you gone radio rental? What are you talking <laughs> about? They just did it. They instantly did it. And as soon as we'd done it, the gate was right in front of us. And we went through the gate, found the stone circle. The weird thing is, on the way, the drive back home, we didn't talk about it. I told John, my mate John, when I got home, but we didn't talk about it on the way back home strange that and that that obviously that were fascinating but just the, the fact that you didn't talk about it that yeah. happens with ufo sightings with the cryptid sightings and i should imagine all manner of other things where people have had something quite profound happen and as you've just pointed out we didn't talk about it it's, have you talked about it since you must have done. oh yeah yeah, yeah i mean the, the, the people involved with it I've, I've lost contact with them now but i mean yeah. i've spoken to people about it loads of times but something else happened uh, when i was in tasmania once um 
I was there with a guy called Mike Williams, who's a friend of mine who also goes looking for the Tasmanian wolf. And we were coming to the end of the expedition and we were going to talk to some friends of his who lived in a farmhouse in the middle of Tasmania near to this artificial lake called Bronte Lagoon, where a lake monster has been seen. But he said that every night, if it's not raining, it won't come if it's raining, that there are weird lights in the woods next to this house. And he said, I've seen them. I think they're supernatural. Now, I mainly wanted to talk to this old couple because they, their daughter had seen a Tasmanian wolf when she was a girl coming home from school. So we went up and stayed the night with them. And the guy was a brummy. He was a Brit. He was a brummy. He married a, uh, a, a woman from Sydney, I think she was, and they moved to Tasmania, built this farmhouse, and they farmed goats. Yeah. What they said that every night, about 10 o'clock at night, these lights will appear in the woods. And they'll go until... 12 midnight and then they'll stop almost as if it's on a timer or it's like a show put on to the start and, and in the same location or just all over the woods um mostly in the same location but they will approach the house and they said one time one came right up close and moved along the window box this little light and in the morning all the plants were dead so i spoke to them about i said the daughter wasn't there so i couldn't interview her but they spoke to about how she'd seen this Tasmanian wolf on the way back from school once years ago and they said there's a, another guy that was, was doing a drive from one side of Tasmania to the other and he'd seen this creature as well and then it, it got to 10 o'clock and we went out to look for these lights I wasn't expecting to see anything and then above a chicken coop this lozenge shaped light about the size and shape of a grape and sort of amber coloured sort of goldy yellowy colour appeared and they said yeah that's one of them and then it went out and then more of them were coming on in the forest now they weren't fireflies or glowworms. i'm just gonna I, yeah well you're beating me to I've it every time them, I'm the insects i've seen them loads of times so as many as four were visible at once some were in midair some were on branches some were on the floor you get to about static. Ten... what is static richard or moving about they were static you right. get ten, 10 foot near to them you get within 10 foot and they'd wink out and then they'd appear deeper in the forest and you'd go in and they'd wink out again and then you'd get to the end of the forest you look back and they were behind you so mike said there's a lighthouse down at this bronte lagoon let's go drive around there and make sure it's got nothing to do with the lighthouse now we drove around to the lighthouse and we found the beam of the lighthouse didn't reach anywhere near this farmhouse or the wood because they were on some on, on an elevation, so it didn't didn't reach them. And anyway, these were points of light; they weren't a solid beam. But looking back from the far side of the lake to the woods, in the trees, in the canopy, was a sphere the size of a beach ball, glowing red. So we drove back round again. By the time we got there, it's gone. But the people from the house had seen it as well. But they seemed to think it was orange rather than red. Yeah, but they say this happens every night unless it's raining. If it's raining, it won't come, and it stops dead on twelve o'clock. And I got up in the middle of the night about two thirty in the morning, and had a look, looked out the window and watched and watched, and there was nothing. It was almost as if it, it's got a cut off time. And it had an almost mechanical feel about it. It's it, right. like the thing I saw on Dartmoor. I think that that was there because we were there. Yeah, this thing it felt almost. Even if there was no one there to watch it, it would just keep It would be doing it. it. It would be yeah. doing it. But <clears throat> we, I want to, to talk about the grey man, or, or if you've any knowledge of, of that to, yes. in the Cairn ones. However, before we do that, and I don't want to just put Les on the spot, but I also want to ask you, in case we forget, where people can obtain your books and where they can find out about you if if les puts his hand up i can still see les and he says and ask me to wait i'll we can wait but uh, if not just fire away and tell us a little bit about your work because i wanted to do it at eight and i forgot well i've, I've written a number of books now i've written oh i think this year my ninth and tenth books are due out which are um the highest strangeness and the first in a two volume set about man eating animals. Uh, but I've written a lot of books. I've written books on dragons, monsters, Japanese folklore. They're all available online. If you go uh, if you go to 
Amazon and type in Richard Freeman, you'll get it. My yeah. latest two were Adventures in Cryptozoology and In Search of Living Monsters, my two most recent ones. Uh, our website, the Center for Fortean Zoology, is www.cfz.org.uk and you can join the Center for Fortean Zoology there as well. And um, the guy I mentioned earlier who came on our expedition and saw the around Pendek, he was just an ordinary guy that signed up, joined the CFZ and said, look, can I come on one of your ex expeditions? I can pay me way. Uh, Dave Archer, he was called. First expedition, first day in the jungle, he sees a cryptid. So, uh, yeah, and he's been on loads of expeditions since then. He's been to Russia with us, hunting the, the Almasti, the Russian wild man, and all over the place, um, Tajikistan. But we're the only people that do this sort of stuff regularly, go around the world. There are people who look for Bigfoot in America and stuff, but we're the only ones that are really international in the English speaking world anyway, that go all over the world looking for these creatures. But yeah, go on to Amazon, type in Richard Freeman. I, I'm not the American guy that does yoga. That's a different Richard Freeman. <laughs> but um, anything to do with monsters and it will be me. That's fabulous, Richard. Thank you. And, uh, you know, I, I probably, Les will probably put a bit more up in description later, but uh, yeah. it's great. And if anyone sure... wants to contact me personally, my um, email is is doctor3uk at yahoo.com. Doctor3uk at yahoo.com. Yeah, all lowercase, doctor, the written word, three, the numerical, doctor3uk yeah. at yahoo.com. You're not you're not actually putting it out that you're a Doctor Who fan, really, are you? You're not you're not yeah. really sure. <laughs> so, the Grey Man. Uh, th this the fascinates man, me. The book to read on that was written in 1970 by a guy called um, Affect Affect Grey, I think his name was. But that up until 1970, that gives you all of the sightings. A lot of them are very ambiguous. People yeah. have got up there and I've got a feeling of fear and then come running down the mountain. Actual sightings of it are very rare. And it's this huge, grey, towering, ghostly figure. It seems less like a Bigfoot, more like something more ethereal. Something yeah, more kind of an apparition. There's Welsh version, yeah, there's a Welsh version as well called the Grey King. It's supposed to haunt okay. the, the woods in, in Wales. So it seems to be what's called a genus loci. A spirit of place, a some sort of spirit is, is attached to a particular area. So, so you've no desire to get up into the Kern going gowns and oh, it's just, yeah, it's, been, just, yeah. it's just getting up there, getting the time. I like to go and stay up there, stay in a bothy and see what happens. Yeah, yeah. Count I like, me I in. Love, I love Scotland anyway. Scotland. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> so, so, so then, Richard, what about? Um, hauntings and and the so not just light phenomena but hauntings and poltergeist activity surrounding the appearance of we'll just say the bigfoot and, and other cryptids do you, do you find a lot of that yeah within the, the accounts yeah. that you're given in this new book there is so much of it so much of it and like people have seen ufos there's a there's a case from 1974 um from Essex, I think it was, it was at the uh, Averley, the Averley abduction. This family were driving along, they drive into this, what looks like a wall of green mist, and they're taken by these entities, and they say there are two types, the short one with bat-like faces, with big ears, and with pointed, you know, ace of spades shaped noses and weird eyes that seem to be like the servitors, and then these tall, spare ones with face, you know, the faces covered, you can just see their eyes, and uh, they were abducted by these, I think, several times. But at the same time, there were a lot of poltergeist outbreaks in their in their house going on at the same time. Now, so try so what? Sorry, no, go trying to explain ghosts as spirits of the dead is about like trying to explain UFO sightings and abductions as aliens. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense because they're just so weird and bizarre. And strange. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples to go back to Doctor Who. My favourite Doctor was John Pertwee, the third Doctor. Well, never, I would um, never have guessed that. <laughs> and he's, uh, as a boy, he was born in um, 1919, so this would probably be the 20s. 
as a boy he used to go and stay with a school friend in the school holidays and they owned a big mansion and i think it was in in sussex and it was or, or sussex or suffolk i can't remember which but um it had a uh, it was elizabethan and it had like a minstrel's gallery and stuff and one day they had guests there so he couldn't stay where he was usually staying the room which he usually stayed and they were going to put him in another room in a wing of the house that wasn't usually used and the father he overheard the father of his friend talking to his mother saying are you sure it's going to be okay to put the boy there and she said oh he's a sound sleeper he, he, he won't notice anything and he was thinking what are they on about what are they talking about so he wakes up in the middle of the night and has a foul smell and he describes it as being like the carcass of a rotting sheep and he's, he's sick he throws up so he goes and washes the bedclothes and drives them over a boiler and he's a bit embarrassed but they ask him if he had a good night's sleep in the morning and he lies and says yes because he doesn't want to admit he'd been sick and so the the mother says to the father i told you so i told you he's a sound sleep and he's wondering what they're talking about the next night he wakes up again and there's this same vile smell but he sees this thing slowly crawling towards his bed that he describes as a tree trunk that's crawling on its roots and it's glowing green stinks of rotting flesh and there are like balls of light appearing from the side of it and then vanishing like bubble balls but they're not popping their fancy and he freaks out and runs out of the room and the father says to the mother then i told you we shouldn't have put him in that room and after that he said the whole of that wing was locked up and never used again and they never got to the bottom of it but if you're going to make up a story about a ghost why make up a story about a crawling glowing tree stump tree stump there's another, yeah there's another story from south africa in the 1890s about a poltergeist outbreak where a girl amongst other things a girl was getting her hair a braid tied to the posts of an old-fashioned bedstead you know the brass yeah yeah post and um the father brought in some friends of his to do a vigil and they saw something pulling at a hair they saw a hair being pulled by something invisible and then this thing manifests and it's a crab it's a giant glowing floating crab that floats around and bumps into things once again what why how what yeah. you wouldn't make something like that up no if you were going to talk some My demon or something you, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It'd be like a nun or a monk or a gray lady or something like <coughs> it's yeah. really weird and, and, and I, I wonder how much of that is uh, that we're creating or is it some kind of real unexplained phenomena and i know that into right or a wrong answer there richard it's just me just sort of speculating well, i don't know column a, still from column b yeah and we'll go to column les drake i think in a moment and see if there's any questions uh if, if you're good for some questions richard before we kind of wind this down we've got about 15 oh, minutes left yeah, yeah thank yeah. you okay i'll put this one on from martin abbas uh, what is the strangest cryptid you have heard of oh if we're talking about flesh and blood animals then it's got to be the mongolian death worm because it, it, it's, it's just a really strange creature <coughs> if we're talking about <coughs> paranormal entities then there are these things called the flats they've been given the name the flats and there seem to be these flat totally flat hairy things that appear and they can slide under doors and creep around on the floor there's a, um, a place in somerset called the charter house which is an old building that you can um rent out and in, in the early 80s a guy there who's ex-military who was the caretaker there he would come in and see that all the um, mountain rescue equipment was clean and working and he'd look after it and he said one night he was in there it was all locked up and he heard something scratching at the door and he thought it's a fox or a badger outside and then it, it seemed to have got into the kitchen somehow he couldn't work out how it got into the kitchen and then it he heard it coming up the stairs and then it was scratching at his door and he thought what the hell's going on and then it seemed to slide under the door <laughs> so whatever it was was incredibly flat and then it attacked him it jumped at his leg and he, it was like flat like a pancake but hairy 
and it was biting it somehow biting the claw and his lady kicked it off and it retreated back the way it came there's another story from ireland about a guy in the middle of the night who treads on one of these things and it screams like a human but it's this flat pancake shaped hairy thing that slides along the floor what the hell is that what is it it's another one another one comes through a window comes under through a window and pins a woman down on the bed a bigger one but once again flat flat hairy thing fascinating oh that's answered your question martin <clears throat> the flat it's, yeah michael canetti a uh, bigfoot slash uh, sasquatch surely the phenomenon must be an ancient hominid species not that of an undiscovered ape species yes yes it very probably is well there's more than one type around the world it's not just one type of mystery primate with the sasquatch and i think also the asian yeti and the russian almasty we're dealing with some sort of relic hominid a it's not a human but it's a relative of one of the ancestors of humans so it's a big hairy creature but it's more closely related to human beings than apes uh <coughs> in um 19 in 2018 a british vet called mark evans took a yeti hunting expedition to bhutan in the himalayas and they took samples from a lake in the mountains and they were looking for in eDNA, that's environmental DNA. When an animal walks through an environment, particularly in water, they'll leave cells of their skin in it. And if you can drain them out, if you, if you can isolate them, you can tell what animals have been drinking from this pool or moving through it. And they found that there was a, a, an animal called the Marco Polo sheep, a very big, rare um, wild sheep that had been drinking from this lake. And they didn't know that they were in the area. So that was a good discovery but they also found eDNA from a primate and whatever this primate was it shared about 98.5 percent of genetic makeup with human beings so whatever it was was more closely related to us than it was to chimpanzees and than, than chimpanzees and gorillas are related to us more closely related than a chimp or a gorilla hmm. is to us. so uh there are no apes there are no known apes uh, in Bhutan, and it wasn't a monkey. There are monkeys in Bhutan, but this wasn't a monkey. It was something much more closely related to human beings. So it's probably a relic hominid, and it's probably the Yeti. The Russian Almasty seems like it might be a descendant of a, 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 a branch of Homo erectus or Homo habilis. The the Yeti and the Sasquatch and the, the Chinese Yeren are much bigger, much bigger than, a much more bestial, if you will. The, the Russian Almasty is slightly bigger than a human. Uh, it's, got a, it's more primitive than a Neanderthal. It's not a Neanderthal. It's more primitive, but it's not as primitive looking or as massive as the Yeti or the Sasquatch. The Orang Pendek is an ape. We think the Orang Pendek is an ape. But a lot of these other things are um, are ancient hominins. So just like Michael says, he's completely correct there, I think. Okay. Cool. And, uh, thanks for that answer. Yeah, Alex Thompson, even in Richard, in your experience, the Orang Pendek possibly more paranormal in nature than just an animal no like it's just no, there's no. Nothing, yeah. nothing to indicate that orang pendek is paranormal it leaves footprints i've seen its footprints and its handprints and I, i've worked with apes closely uh, when i was a zookeeper I, I worked mainly with reptiles but i've worked with a lot of apes as well <laughs> and i've seen their footprints and these were the footprints of an ape but they were differently shaped to any known species of ape but they had the offset big toe that's typical of the apes we got hair from it that's been analysed and shown to be from some unknown species of ape. No one attributes any supernatural powers to the orang pendek. It's, it's an animal. It's an animal just, in the same way that an orangutan is an animal. Just undiscovered or uh, not not recognised at at the moment. It, we, you know yeah. it's real. It's not recognised. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, I've got um, David Drummond. Uh, more of an observation than a question. It was announced on today on STV News that NASA are to help to look for Nessie. Do you know anything about that? Oh, that's uh, good. No, yeah. I've not heard uh, that, but right, that's yeah. very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah great. The, I hope they get somewhere. And what yeah, methods they're proposing to do there, Richard? Yeah. No idea. No idea. But, uh, you know, they've sent hmm. submarines down before, but the the water's so murky and full of peat, you can't see very far. Mm. Sonar is 
sonar and um, eDNA are the best things. There was an eDNA um, test done by uh, scientists from New Zealand a couple of years ago, and they got masses of eel DNA from that. So they, right. they were saying they think the monster is a giant eel. But Loch Morra, which is not too far away from Loch Ness, is even deeper. And um, there's no tourist industry there. There's no visitor's centre or, you know, Loch Morra t-shirts or cuddly Loch Morras. But people, people still see monsters in Loch Morra like they're doing Loch Ness. And the water yeah. there is much clearer because it's not got peat in it. So that might be a better bet than Loch Ness to research and do some investigation. I was going to put money behind it. I would do Loch Morra rather than Loch Ness. Excellent. Loch Ness has all the limelight. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly has. Uh, Branch Snapper, uh, can Richard tell us about his possible orang Pendak uh, oh, encounter at his hotel balcony? No, that that's that wasn't the Orang Pendek, that was the Russian Almasty, and it wasn't a hotel, it was a ruined farmhouse. Right. We were in the Caucasus Mountains of Russia <coughs> looking for this wild man called the Almasty, and the Russians took it so seriously that in the Soviet period, they had, a, in the 1950s, they had a commission, a government-backed commission to search for this creature. It's about seven feet tall, thick brow ridge, flattened nose, thin lips, covered with hair, big mane of hair on the back. doesn't use fire. It will throw rocks and use clubs like the Yeti does, but it doesn't use, it, it can't use fire. Um, and there's this ruined farmhouse about three miles from a town called Neutrino in the Caucasus Mountains. And it had been abandoned since the 1970s, but the Almasty was supposed to lurk around it sometimes. There's a story about some um, shepherds hanging out on the balcony there and the door at the end of the balcony opened and a seven foot almasty was there strode along the balcony got one of the men just moved him out of the way carried on its way and leapt off the end of the balcony and one of our our um, people we were with uh, a ukrainian guy called uh, an archaeologist called uh, anatoly serendenko he'd seen an almasty around there as well and another guy we were with, um, Gregory Panchenko, who's a Ukrainian biologist, he had got to within 10 feet of an Almasty in another old farmhouse, not the same one. But he had seen this, this thing in a, in a barn. Um, mm. Anyway, we staked it out. And there were three rooms in this old farmhouse and an L-shaped veranda going around them, but no interlocking doors. So if you wanted to go from one room to the other, you had to come out onto the balcony. Um, they they said that these things were active at night, but there was a lull about 10.30, and then they were active again later on. So we put out fruit, like um, cherries, and, and we put out meat and stuff, and uh, honey, set up camera traps. Um, they're supposed to make a noise like a bird twittering. One of the witnesses we talked to was a woman who'd seen one just after World War II. She said it was twittering like a bird, it was making this twittering noise. Gregory Panchenko said the one that he saw in the, the old barn was making this twittering noise. Anyway, we were staking it out, <coughs> this old farmhouse, about 10 o'clock at night, and it's dark then, there's a twittering noise, and one of the camera traps goes off. We see the flash from a camera trap, and there's a twittering noise, and we think, wow, can that be what we think it is? So we waited, nothing more happened, and it got to about two o'clock in the morning. So we went into one of the rooms, because it was getting cold, and warmed ourselves around this old stove. My mate Dave Archer, who's the guy that saw the Orang Pende, he uh, crashed out on a manky old mattress and fell asleep. And I was there with this guy called Adam Davis. And if you can ever get him on the show, he's really good. He lives in the States now. He's originally from Manchester. Uh, he's another cryptozoologist like me who's been all over the world hunting monsters. Yeah, top bloke. And the door to this room was slightly ajar. And the door was, it's a big door, big oak door. And it's about seven foot tall, this door. Slightly ajar. And it was a, a clear night. And there was mo the moon was out and there was stars. So the starlight and the moonlight were coming through the door. 
Then we hear this deep guttural vocalization. It sort of goes bum, 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 sort of sounds. And I said, did you hear that? And Adam said, yeah. Then about 25 seconds later, something walks along the veranda. Whatever that thing is, it's, it's, it's on two legs. It's walking along on two legs. And as it passes the door, it blocks out the moonlight and the starlight to a height of seven foot plus. So it was something on two legs that was over seven feet tall. And I said to, to Adam, it's on the veranda. We grab our digital cameras and run out. But whatever it was, it had vanished into the night. And all there was was darkness and silence. And we did a circuit of the, the area, but we couldn't find it. In the morning, we looked on the camera traps, but all we could see was vegetation moving about. So I could have been within 10, 12 foot of an owl masty. Excellent. Interesting. I want to ask a question, but we've, we've literally got five minutes left. So I think we should devote it to any questions we've got, Les. Yeah, and uh, we might just have to fly through some of these. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Require a little bit more answering, but we'll try and uh, get these on the screen. Silver Fox, do you think that some dogmen have been created by governments, uh, Richard? No. Well, that's that's a, fine. Brilliant. Thank you. That's a brilliant answer. Yeah, and uh, oh, I've got this one, Branch Snapper. Are there any new expeditions planned? Yes. Yeah, I'm. Um... My, my grandfather, who I was very close to, passed away last year. He was 95. I've inherited his house. I'm selling it. I'm going to use some of the money to mount expeditions. I'm hoping to go to Iriomote Island, which is on an archipelago off the South Island of Japan. And there's supposed to be a new species, one that's got a big cat there. I also want to go to Flores in um, eastern Indonesia, where the Ibu Gogo, or Homo floresiensis, might still be alive on the eastern tip of the island in the mountainous forests um, i also wow. want to go and get the giant crocodiles okay brilliant that, thanks for that richard uh brand snapper is it true all yours and the team's batteries failed during the Bolum lake investigation yes yeah yeah they did <clears throat> a lot of them so we had to replace them yeah. i didn't Fully see anything really at, at Bolum myself Fully, but yeah the charge batteries failed yeah and uh, put this on from Madeline Wick here. Yeah. Have you had any reports of groups seen in populated areas, cities, streets, neighbourhoods? Yeah, I wrote an I wrote an article on that once about cryptid seen in, in urban areas. Yeah, there's there's been a few of them. I know. So the Bigfoot has been seen in suburban areas occasionally, um, and and things that you know couldn't live there have, have, have turned up as mm -hmm. well. There's been you know sightings of, of sea serpents. You know, seen off San Francisco in built up areas. Um, I'm trying to think now because I wrote a whole article on this very subject, and now you put me on the spot. I'm just struggling <laughs> yeah, to remember. Uh, we'll no, probably save that for another uh, uh, day, Richard. Yeah, we really, really yeah, are running out of time. Yeah, that's been quite a few. Yeah, that's been quite yeah, a few. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, a little bit of credit here from Rick Allen. You are the real Indiana Jones, yeah. Richard. You're the man. There you go. Thanks, and Thanks, following yeah. on from that, yeah, excellent. Thanks for all your uh, your email, Richard. Uh, get ready. Oh. And uh, that's practically that's about all we can get through. Uh, Do you want to ask your question, uh, Paul? I, I forgot what it was. Okay, uh, thanks, to <laughs> Tina, for the monetary contribution tonight as well. Thanks, Tina. No, no, uh, it, it, it's, it's just been fascinating, Les, hasn't it? You know, we've, yeah. We've, We've we really run out of time now. It's it. We could that do was, another two hours, there, Richard. Tip of the iceberg. Yeah. That one. Yeah. Well, but, uh, well, uh, well. One question is: Will you come back and share some more with us? Definitely, definitely. Uh, send me your postal address, and when the book's out, I'll send you a copy of the book because I quote you in it about some of the right. the werewolf sightings up at Bempton. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. That's that's absolutely fabulous. So, Paul. Um, uh, can I just put in and uh, can you get, tell people about your uh, truthproof.uk uh, uh, yeah, yeah, much, yeah, much the same as Richard. The the ebooks are available on Amazon. The Wolflands documentary you can get through truthproof.uk or you can get it on Amazon Prime. And we have a website, Truth. obviously I've just done that, truthroof.uk, where you can get the paperback versions of the books. And if Richard wants to contact me, 
in the next week or so, we can put some links on our website to Richard's books as well, which I'd love yeah. to do. And a, lot, yeah. a lot of links are in tonight's description. Great documentary, by the way. That was really good. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm yeah, you oh, Les is responsible for that, which is me. The guy camping in the old house where the thing was outside, that was really creepy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and so many traits. And like, like you've just said, there's so much more that we can do and, and mm -hmm. talk again because... The, the movement of these things moving like they're on escalators are almost like they're just we, the top we we gotta go. yeah we've got to go now we're out of time and thanks richard and thanks paul and we'll see everybody in the stream yeah. next time we'll come on on the truth Brother live stream thank thanks, you richard paul. thank you les and jess for doing moderating thank you jess good night